Across the globe, disadvantaged communities in low-lying areas are facing an increased threat of flooding from severe rain events and storm surges due to climate change and sea level rise. In 2015, the New York Community Trust provided funding to the Association of National Estuary Programs to engage communities living in areas vulnerable to these impacts. The goals of this initiative, to support communities in assessing vulnerabilities of their surrounding environments, engage them in determining activities to build resilience, adapting strategies to help improve community resilience, and to share lessons learned through the process. Their stories offer important perspectives on how local leadership can increase the resilience of their communities. For over a century, the North Shore of Staten Island in New York has been a manufacturing hub due to its proximity to the rest of the metropolitan area and navigable waters. But through poor shoreline management and rising seas, these hazardous industrial sites are increasingly threatening low-lying communities. The New York, New Jersey Harbor Program partnered with the North Shore Waterfront Conservancy in their ongoing efforts to create action through awareness of these dangerous sites and this situation. People kept saying somebody needs to do something. I live here and I had people that are my neighbors that I liked dying of cancer. They were just dropping off one after the other. And then I started doing research about the Archer Daniel Midlands Manhattan Project site and finding out that it was radioactive and that it had been radioactive for some 70 years. I'm like, okay, if we have one site that has a contamination issue, how many other sites have contamination issues? We identified 21 sites with contamination issues. NSWC uses boat tours to illustrate the state of the northern shoreline of Staten Island and to point out the 21 contaminated sites. They provide two tours. The first is aimed at concerned residents, political leaders, representatives from government agencies, and social justice organizations. The second is for fifth graders from the local elementary school. Today we did our, our North Shore Waterfront Conservancy environmental justice boat tour. And the boat tour was to give people a sense of understanding that the North Shore is where you have your heavy duty industry. You have a waterfront filled with contaminants that have been here for 150 years. Those contaminants can migrate off of that waterfront, off of that property that it's on, and back towards the community during a sea level rising, storm surging, and flooding situation. The communities that are at risk, that are living near these manufacturing sites, are low-income people and people of color. We do one tour for fifth graders. They love the bridges, they love the ship graveyard, but they also like the content of what we're talking about in terms of how we affect the environment and how the environment affects us. No one backs up and looks at the bigger picture, and it's very important to look at the bigger picture, and today we were looking at the whole picture for Staten Islanders. NSWC used insights from these tours and other outreach activities to prepare and distribute a community brief for city officials. This document outlines an integrated strategy that uses wetland restoration, living shorelines, and better shoreline management to reduce the neighborhood's vulnerability to climate change. If we are able to get 19 of the 21 sites that we identified as having contamination issues cleaned up, that would be a great legacy. As Mobile, Alabama's population soared in the 1940s and 50s, a disregard for the value of wetlands left low-lying areas in the MLK Avenue and Tolmanville communities vulnerable to frequent flooding. Completed in 2013, the Three Mile Creek Watershed Management Plan identified Tulman Spring Branch as a major area of flooding. In 2015, the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program partnered with a team from Auburn University to collect data and perform stormwater modeling to better understand the hydrology of the lower reaches of the watershed to help build resilience in this distressed area where over 40% of households live in poverty. The whole idea was to engage residents to see if they were even aware that they lived in a watershed 
and to further explore how resilient they were to respond should a natural disaster occur, such as a Hurricane Katrina. And so what we were able to do is facilitate conversation and to help them gain insight into the fact that, you know, these are opportunities to help revitalize, restore, improve the quality of life in your area by addressing an environmental concern. And I think we were most successful in making the connection. Residents needed that connection. Why is it that today, you know, of all things that I need to be worried about environmental hazards in my community? Most residents of the Toulmanville community have lived there for decades, but across Three Mile Creek, the MLK Avenue community is evolving. We got engaged in working with the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program and partnering with our Leadership Academy where we took citizens, emerging leaders, reluctant leaders from the community. And so the residents learned about, you know, what a watershed is, uh, why Three Mile Creek needs to be properly maintained, how it potentially can help in the reduction of flooding, as well as improve water quality for the community. Members of the Leadership Academy not only became civically active through engaging with city government leaders, they also precipitated the creation of a conservation corps to employ young men and women from the community to help implement recommendations of the Watershed Management Plan. This program has basically been focused on eradicating invasive species and cleaning out drainage ways for the surrounding cities. We've been asking local homeowners if they would like a rain barrel to help so they can have another way to use their water and also help the city of Pritchard with their flooding and the impact it's having every time it heavily rains. So you familiar with rain barrels? That takes me back to when I was a little girl. Uh -huh. And my mama and daddy would sit they what you call it, uh -huh. rain uh -huh. hills uh -huh. around and they would wash with that water, yes. just like you say. Yes, uh-huh. And so that, that would be good. Yeah. Following a devastating hurricane and subsequent Great Depression, large waves of migrants in the 1930s moved from the hills of Puerto Rico into San Juan. So the Canyon Martin Peña is a tidal channel located in the heart of San Juan. It's an integral part of uh, the San Juan Bay Estuary system because it connects the eastern portion of the estuary with the western portion. In that era, people started filling the wetland and building their own homes in the margins of the canyon. A channel that used to be up to 400 feet wide now is in some areas up to three feet wide. A lot of the communities in this area have a lack of adequate infrastructure, uh, which means that a lot of uh, raw sewage discharges into the channel. Uh, if you add a clogged channel with an influx of raw discharge, uh, what you have is a public health issue. Uh, every time it rains here, uh, it communities have a potential of getting flooded with contaminated water, which also affects the quality of life of the over 26,000 residents living in this area. In San Juan, the community building process began 20 years ago, providing residents a head start in implementing measures to improve resiliency. So whenever we find resources like the one from the New York Community Trust, we communicate with the, with the community leaders and those local entities that are working with them to see what their priorities are. And in this case, we wanted to advance the, the whole issue of making less vulnerable, more resilient, the community of the Martin Peña Channel. The project is divided into three stages. The first stage is an assessment of the community, how the community was adapting in the face of climate change. The second stage was us with the children. After providing workshops about what climate change was, we incorporating GIS and photographing their surroundings. The kids were able to develop um, rap songs about climate change. They were bringing words that would come to their mind about climate change, which is probably inundación, which is flooding, and vulnerabilidad, which is vulnerability. So it was just a, a very cool way for them um, to be absolutely engaged. And then after that, we went ahead and put together some specific uh, adaptation 
strategies right in the backyard of this middle school where we were providing the workshops. So we have a multiple benefit project in the Wayne Garden, water quality, uh, public health, because if you reduce the stagnant water, you want to reduce the breeding area of mosquito, and also you, you will attract wildlife. But the most beautiful thing about this project is that what implemented in the backyard of a public school. Así que para nosotros es bien importante el apoyo eh, del estuario en este proceso. Eh, este proceso de que en este momento involucra la comunidad, involucra la comunidad, la facultad de la escuela y toda la escuela como tal, aún los padres de, de, de los estudiantes de nuestra escuela. Hurricanes Irma and Maria of 2017 provide a horrifying reminder of how poor water management affects the people living in these low-lying areas. As the community undertakes a daunting rebuilding process, projects that help educate them about climate change and adaptation techniques are critical components of the larger strategy to relocate whole neighborhoods and restore historical water flow. Poor and minority communities everywhere are being disproportionately impacted by natural disasters and flooding. Through the work of the New York Community Trust, Association of National Estuary Programs, and hundreds of nonprofits and dedicated volunteers, vulnerable communities are organizing and finding new ways to build capacity to enhance their resilience to the threats of climate change.